Speaking of the Distinguished Guest Minister Weekend, it is my honor and my privilege uh, to introduce to you Reverend John Crestwell, um, as well as uh, John's wife, Joni, Joni Crestwell, who is here in the front row. Welcome, Joni. I want to tell a story about um, how I met John um, I met John way back in, I think it was the fall of 2007. Um, I was in my fourth year of ministry. John was in just his second year of ministry, and we were two of 12 ministers invited by the UUA to come together and to talk about how to do really exciting, exceptional ministry, and it was called the Listening to Experience Conference, and I'll tell you, between the two of us, we had a lot less experience than a lot of the other guests there, but I was really touched by, by John's um, contributions to that. Uh, so we had this idea of doing a Distinguished Guest Minister Weekend, and what I did last spring was I put together a list of 15 different UU ministers who I thought were doing exciting ministry, who would be really great to have as a guest, and then I gave those list of 15 names to our worship ministry team, and they went home and they did their research and they went online and they read sermons and they listened to sermons and they read articles, and then they got to vote on who to bring in. And... John Crestwell ran away with the voting. He was the top vote getter by a considerable margin. John uh, serves as the associate minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Annapolis and is also the founding minister of Awake Ministries, um, which offers a whole bunch of different programs, everything from prison ministry to life coaching uh, to consultations with congregations, which he's in town doing that, doing this this weekend, um, all the way to worship in an energetic and, and emotionally literate style. And it is my privilege and my fortune to be able to introduce him, and won't you give, uh, won't you give Reverend Cresswell a great big Chapel Hill welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. This song we're going to sing for you is by Nicholas Page, and it's called We Pray. Nicholas Page uh, wrote this song for a friend. His friend, he said to his friend, what can I do for you, man? I just feel so bad. His friend said, pray for me. And Nick said, I'm not much of a prayer, but I, I am a writer. So he went and wrote this song. As you figure it out, join in. Sometimes I feel so discouraged And feel my works in vain But then the Holy, the Holy Spirit Revives my soul Again and again and again and so we pray Bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole a healing power in Gilead. 
Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. And that's why I know that we pray. Oh, sing, we pray. Come on and sing. I don't know what you call it, prayer, meditation, getting in touch with your innermost self, but it's necessary, it's needed, especially in a world so broken, a world in need of healing. We need that collective consciousness to come together and to pray and to say, we want beloved community. We pray. time to pray. So let us uh, center ourselves in our chairs and try to be here right now, as Rumi says. As we close our eyes or contemplate or sit with these words. To that creative sustaining force in the universe whom many call God, who some call life. We give thanks for this incredible day, for this incredible congregation, for your leadership, for your love. Give thanks for this beautiful weather that has come. We give thanks for all those joys, including last night's joy. For some people, <laughs> we give thanks for laughter, to be able to hold hands, to, for the hugs that we get in this congregation, and for this faith that gives us space to be who we are. Then play me a little bit of that song. I like listening to music. Just letting it vibrate through me. And I like music and message, so I'm sharing these words with my eyes closed and allowing spirit to speak through me. We need this time, we need this time to come together. We need this time to sit with our agonies and our discoveries. We need this time. Blessings on this community for giving us the space to make this time. Might we continue to be generous to this community that allows us to live out our values in the world? Blessings on this community, blessings on the work you do in the greater world, and thank you so much for having me here. In the name of all that is virtuous and righteous and good, I leave these words. Amen.
the song is Love Is My Decision. I, I love this song. It's by my friend Daniel Ahmad. It's one I hope you will, again, make a part of your music repertoire. The choir, are you going to help me sing this song? All right, come on. I'm going to sing the first verse, and then, as you all are willing and able, you come on in, okay? If the words are in your order of service. Insert. Love is my decision. It's up to me to give of my heart. Love is my decision. No one else can tell me to start. And once I decide to change my mind God will show me how Oh, love is my decision My decision right here and now Let us rise in body and those spirit Come on, second verse Love is my decision It's up to me to stand on that bridge Oh, love is my decision And no one else can make me forgive bye, bye, bye. Oh, and once I decide to change my mind, come on, sing it. The God will show me how. Oh, love is my decision. My decision right here and now. The life that I dreamed of has finally begun. Cause sure as the sun shines down on me, I am the one, hey, to set myself free. Come on, sing. It's up to me to dance down the road. All right. The love is my decision. But no one else can lighten my load. Oh, and once I decide to change. Decision right here and now. My decision right here and now. Fantastic. Give yourselves a hand. You did awesome. Come on, give yourselves a hand. What's wrong with you? Come on. You did awesome. You did awesome. It's okay to clap in church. And for those of you at my workshop, thank you. That's right. It's okay. I bet you all were clapping at that game last night. If you can clap at a basketball game, you can certainly clap in church.
So I, I give thanks for being here today, and um, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share with you. It's been a, it's been a great weekend, and I am truly humbled, um, have been selected as the first. And uh, Tom says I've, I've raised the bar really high. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's good. Uh, as you can tell, I, um, I do this. And I try to be as authentic as possible. You're seeing the real me. I'm like this 24-7. Unless I'm hungry <laughs> or tired, then you might get a different version. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. Emotional literacy is our salvation. Emotional literacy is our salvation. Langston Hughes wrote these words, I dream a world. I dream a world where human, humans no other human will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white Whatever race you be, we'll share the bounties of the earth and every soul is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all humankind. Of such I dream my world. Langston Hughes describes my world too. It's one of my favorite poems, I want to be a part of this earth. How do we get there? Where do we go from here? Those are good questions, Reverend John. And I hope to answer these questions before I'm, before I'm done. I first read this poem at General Assembly in 2012. I was selected as the Sunday morning preacher and one of the leaders in worship, and in front of 4,000 zealous Unitarian Universalists, <laughs> I shared my dream. As I finished uh, tears in my eyes, I looked up, and the audience was on its feet. I had, I had done my job. I should have been high. My ego fed by all the praise and thanksgiving, but instead I was, I was sad, couldn't put my finger on it. But more than that, I felt like there had to be more than the prescription I'd given the crowd. I said, go home and start a little trouble. I encouraged them to go back to their congregations and do like Dr. King said years ago when he had given the Ware Lecture in the 50s. Go home and be a rabble rouser in the name of justice. I told them, justice is love and action. Stand up and speak out and keep pushing and we will get to beloved community one day. All good words, I still believe those words, but for some reason, something felt like it was missing from, from my ministry, from my message. And even weeks later, I was sort of in a funk I didn't know why. I meditated and sang and tried to get my mojo back. I hadn't even been in the ministry 10 years and I felt like I'd already been to the mountaintop, that I had given my best, that there was really nothing left for me to do in this faith, that I had looked over and I'd seen the promised land and it was a long, long away, way away. How in the world could we all speed up the day when all of God's children, black and white and brown and yellow, could sing in that old, sing the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we're free at last. How can we get people to fix this world when so many come with the wrong spirit? We need the spirit of mutuality and humility and the understanding that we're all one. The spirit of love and not the spirit of, of separateness and paternalism and narcissism. 
So I was just really down. But slowly over that summer in 2012, the answers began to come to me. Gandhi's words, be the change you wish to see. Or that old saying, fix yourself and fix the world. I began to realize that we mend this world first by focusing on our own issues, our shame, our guilt, our desires, our pride, our ego. It is said that hurt people hurt people and suddenly it made sense to me. My failed marriage. It started making sense to me. All of my past failings came to mind. But the more I went inside and analyzed what was really going on at the time, what's going on in me now, it felt like my world was getting better and better. As the inside healed, the outside healed. And as a part of that process, I began to think about human history. Some of the ugly stories of our past, the Nazis, colonialism, the KKK, Jim Crow, police brutality, 9-11, terrorism, hate crimes, GBLTQ persecution, you name it, it all stems from fear. The Oxford Dictionary defines fear as an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or a threat. I came to see that in our quest for survival as a species, we use fear as a means of protecting ourselves, our tribe, and our people, so to speak, from hurt, harm, or danger. But who is or are our people? Just those who look like us? I propose that we must continue to expand who our people are. Now, we don't do this with legislation, that helps. We don't do it with lofty speeches, it helps. But we do it with being in relationship with someone that's different from us. It is really more unlikely that you will spit in the face of someone that you love. It is highly unlikely that you will be supportive of laws that would deny someone that is close to you food or a child that you know clothes. And so what is our job then? Our job is to expand the circle of privilege so that no one is left behind unless they choose to be. That's my whole ministry. We gotta widen the circle of privilege. We got to know how to go into communities and be in relationship with people. Not going there judging and making all these presuppositions and suppositions. Not going in there and assuming that they're a victim. But just being there when the time comes to hear their stories, their joys, their sorrows, their pains, their passions. That's it. First. And the strange thing about it, and I see this in our prison ministry, the more we go in and, and try to do good work, this emotional literacy work, the more we are learning about ourselves and that the work actually is for us, not so much for them. True. Indeed, the scripture is right. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I saw that when I went to the Philippines. You read all the studies, you look at everybody in America is all anxious and all upset about this, that, and the other. We went to the Philippines in 2012, and I saw the poorest and happiest people on the face of the earth. And I began to understand life very differently. Maybe being a first world is actually being last. Maybe with all the pleasures and joys 
We don't know how to appreciate pleasure and joy. And I began to look at religion. But religion in its, in its beauty, I just wrote a book about it as a fact, that's a plug. <laughs> religion, as originally presented, is absolutely beautiful. Now what human beings, out of fear and a need to suppress and control other people, now what they've done with it, that's the problem. But religion can be beautiful. And it's up to us to raise our consciousness to see the sleight of hand that's taking place within religion or politics, that keeping us separate and divided, trying to show us that we're not one interconnected web of existence, that every person has worth and dignity. We have somehow become too brainwashed by, by culture, thinking that we're better than other people or that, you know, they need us to help them. In fact, I think more and more that if we raise our consciousness more and help ourselves, we will very quickly move ourselves in the right direction to fix the world. And we do that by putting our lower primitive animal-like tendencies to rest. And that's all fear-based. It's guilt-based, it's shame-based, and there is no beloved community down this path, only destruction and annihilation. Only chaos and not community. But I know we can do better than this. I say all this to say was this was the impetus, this was the thing that pushed me to start Awake Ministries. I couldn't articulate it as much as I can now. I kept looking at the civil rights movement and all of the things that have happened in the world, and I realized it's because people didn't have relationships with people. They were scared of each other. They were threatened by each other, and so they were emotionally illiterate. Emotional literacy means I learn how to express my underlying feelings and needs in positive ways that help me lift up the worth and dignity in myself and in others. So in other words, I learned to communicate without judgment. I learned how to be in relationship with other people, places, and things. And AWAKE is an acronym. It means actualize your wisdom, awaken to your karma, and engage the process. Find your inner wisdom. It's there. We all have this inner knowing. We, we know our answers. Actualize your wisdom. Awaken to your karma actions. Awaken to those actions, those lessons that you keep repeating again and again and again, making those same mistakes over and over, that same thinking that keeps you stuck. Awaken to that, and a lesson is repeated until it is, is learned. Awaken to your karma and engage the process. Do something about it. Don't just accept it. This is my lot in life. Do something about it. I believe in Carl Jung's idea of this collective consciousness. And I'm so, I, I'm so certain, I, I can be proven wrong, I'm sure, but I'm so certain right now that if we can, as Unitarian Universalists, as people of, of faith, if we can raise the collective consciousness where people begin to understand how to be in relationship with others, we can turn this planet around very quickly, very quickly. Unfortunately, my research shows that only 36% of human beings are emotionally literate. A new book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Only, so that's 64% uh, of the people around us do not know how to control or respond appropriately under pressure. They don't know how to express their needs, and so instead of, instead of reaching out for help, they act out. Again, I thought this work originally was for at-risk youth or prison ministry, but more and more as I've been around Unitarian Universalists for 15 years, I've discovered that actually we need this work too. Yes. So I'll give you one example. 
there was a gentleman who was angry at me in church. And he was acting out during the congregational meeting. And it was because, essentially, and I apologized, but it was because he had emailed me and, and I didn't respond. He wanted to spend some time with me. And I missed it. I'm sorry. I missed it. But instead of assuming good intentions, he assumed that I was blowing him off. That's emotional illiteracy. Now, we're all emotionally illiterate at times when I'm hungry, <laughs> when I'm sleepy. But I have a good accountability partner, my wife. And since I've been on this journey, she's been on it with me. So she is, she's gotten to be better at it than me. And there's some, some days when I'll be talking and she'll say, you're judging. <laughs> that sounds like a judgment. <laughs> so I have to watch everything I say. Either we're judging something or we're projecting something. Now, psychological projection is when humans defend themselves against their own unpleasant impulses by denying their existence while attributing them to others. For example, and none of us are, are you know, innocent. For example, a person who is habitually rude may constantly accuse other people of being rude. It can take the form of blame shifting. So I, you look at the world and what you discover is blame shifting is actually the entire story. We look at them and say they're taking our jobs or our food. We, they're taking over our, our neighborhoods or our resources. We say they are criminals or they are lazy or unemployable. These are projections. And here's the crazy part about a projection. It creates the reality that you see. So in other words, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when you look at the world and you look at a, a corner of the world that you don't like, guess what? You help to create it. That's a hard message. That's like when the Buddha said, your desires, you suffer because of your desires. It's a hard lesson. That we have created that reality that we see. And that you, all of us, are 100% responsible for changing our thinking to change this reality. How do we do that? We do that, as I said, with an accountability partner. We do that with counseling, with life coaching, through reading personal growth books. Unitarians love their fiction, love the biographies. But a lot of us don't read personal growth books like, you know, um, managing your anger or something like that. You're like, oh, please, that's, that's pop culture. We don't do that. But I, I want to challenge you to, that's really all I read. And, and we get it indirectly, don't get me wrong, from, from PBS and NPR. <laughs> but I want to challenge you to, to keep working on your spirit to work on being less judgmental and recognize the complexities in people, places, and things and your complicity. You know, there is this politician, his name rhymes with stump. <laughs> he appears to be a mess. That's, that's not a judgment. Now, I don't know him. Maybe he is a mess. Maybe he isn't a mess. I don't know. He, he appears to be prideful and egotistical. I hope I'm wrong. But know this. Our collective hatred as a nation helped to create his platform and presence. Just as our collective hope created the first black president in the United States. Don't underestimate the power of your thoughts. They ripple 
out into the collective consciousness like waves, and people pick up on them, you feel those vibes, somebody angry walks into a room and everybody kind of, ooh. We have an impact with our thoughts. Change your story, change your reality, change yourself, and in time we, ch we change the surroundings. We have that kind of power. Change your thinking, change the world. But we have to keep asking ourselves questions as I did a few years ago. What do I need to, to evolve, evolve myself? What do I need to look at within so that my without can manifest? How can I look at the seven principles of our faith again and reimagine what that means for me personally? It all starts with you. It starts with you and then that karmic pattern follows into towns and cities and states and countries all the way out to the universe, super universes, the micro and the macro, all connected. I am it and it is me. There's a call for us to raise our consciousness beyond the primal toward the more spiritual. It's up to you. We will miss the mark. We will make mistakes. I do every day. But today I know better. And as I say, when you know better, you do better. I leave you with some words from my friend, mentor, Reverend Fred Muir from the Unitarian University's Church of Annapolis. He wrote a new book. There's some postcards for his new book. It's called Turning Points, Essays on a New Unitarian Universalism. He gave us some challenging words. Listen. A big step involves moving our congregations from outreach to inreach. This is one of the most challenging shifts. Unitarian Universalists have a significant and impressive history of justice making ministries in and with the larger community. To be clear, we are not suggesting that this history and the ongoing justice work be slowed or abandoned. However, sometimes we Unitarian Universalists would rather do our ministry with partners in the larger community than recognize the justice-making ministry that is needed in our own congregations. Doesn't it often look and feel easier to go out and partner and build coalitions with others in order to change the world than it is to shape our congregations into the beloved community, as described in our principles. Initiating and sustaining the journey to wholeness within a congregation may be as challenging, if not more so, as outside it. Efforts to change the world easily ignore, often con conveniently and with the label of hypocrisy, the hard and humbling ministry to shape our congregations as beloved communities. This is what we mean by moving from outreach to inreach, living the purposes and principles in our faith home. I challenge you this morning to live by the purpose, purposes and principles of our faith home. May the spirit of love and justice go with you. May it be so. Amen. The, uh, the song for the offertory is, is printed in, in the insert to the order of service, and uh, Glenn invites you to join in the uh, singing. Freely we have received of gifts that minister to our needs of body and spirit. Gladly we bring to our church and its wide concerns a portion of this bounty we will now receive the morning offering. You guys are getting your money's worth out of me today. <laughs> I've enjoyed every bit of this. This is not a burden, this is a labor of love. After this, I'm gonna get a little lunch and I'm gonna take a long nap. A nap is a great spiritual practice, did you know that? 
in a bad mood, just take a nap. Life calls us on. Here in reverence now we gather For the blessings we have known With a pledge to one another That we journey not alone Joy and sorrow us wise, kin to all that lives and dies, love calls us on, love calls us on, sing along as you get it, okay, come on, words and deeds of those before us. strong blend our voices in the chorus of creation living song courage bids us lift our eyes upward to the shining sky Life calls us home. 